All right. Well, we will rock and roll here. I would like to welcome everyone and thank you again for joining us for the first webinar uh, from KO Advantage Group this year, The Seven Sales Management Errors Exceptional Leaders Never Make. This is a topic that is certainly near and dear to my heart. As previous to KO Advantage, I uh, was a sales manager for the majority of my sales career. So I'm excited for the first time to really share some of the wisdom and experience um, that I had along my journey with you all. So first, a little bit about us. Who are we? Uh, we have a lot of familiar faces here on the webinar, which is great to see. We have some former students and current students and some uh, new faces and names. KO Advantage Group, we are here to help you sell more faster, but we really focus on providing two things. We provide relief for mastering today's way of hosting meetings, connecting with clients, and selling in this virtual environment. We provide empowerment with the right sales skills and the right habits to help you close sales quicker and even close at higher values. We focus mostly on uh, entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses in the business-to-business -business realm uh, that are really more of a consultative sell, more of a high-value selling the invisible for premium prices model. However, um, you know, we definitely, I think everyone will grab something for, from this webinar, no matter what industry, B2B, B2C, ultimately, we also believe really that people buy from people and uh, people sell to people. A little bit uh, about myself for those of you who are not familiar. That is me there uh, earlier this year hiking at Bear Mountain where I live. Well, I don't live at Bear Mountain, but it's uh, I feel like it's in my backyard. Uh, we live about 25 miles north of New York City, right along the Hudson River, a gorgeous place. If any of you have ever been here uh, to the States and the New York area, there's, believe it or not, lots of great hiking, lots of great wilderness uh, and outdoors, just like 30 minutes outside of New York City. So you really get the best of both worlds. That is, uh, my wife and I, we have a gorgeous little four-year-old miniature, uh, Kleek High is the name of his breed. He is a miniature Husky and uh, he definitely is my number one pal and is like a son to us. In terms of our, my sales background, I joined KO Advantage Group last year in the summer of 2020. It's very much a pandemic disruption story. I was uh, going on seven years with my past company, Equinox Fitness, which is a really a global luxury lifestyle fitness brand, most known for our fitness clubs. And we also have a hotel. Um, and with them, I started in sales seven years back in a, my first commission-based sales role. I fell in love with it. I was very successful right off the bat. And what's a little bit different about my story is after just a year, I was promoted to become a regional sales manager. And I spent the next about six years leading sales teams in the New York tri-state area. So it was very interesting for me to go from uh, being a salesperson for only a year and then going into years of sales management. And part of what I will share today is a lot of what I learned on my journey in doing so. Um, a couple of the accomplishments that I'm really proud of there, we uh, multiple times were named Turnaround Team of the Year or Turnaround Club of the Year. And to win that award, you had to do a couple of things. Uh, one, you had to be in the top five out of 100 teams in the entire company, and you had to have the biggest difference in sales from one year to the next. I love seeing that transformation uh, in, in a team, right, uh, that thinks that you know, uh, maybe that they're struggling and that uh, it's just too hard, it's just too difficult. When really, uh, if, we, if we create the right culture and start with the right behaviors and the right activities, and we ultimately believe and are goal focused, incredible things can happen. Uh, further, I also had the opportunity to start leading corporate sales training. So about four of those years, I also went into New York City on a monthly basis to lead the first day of sales training for, uh, for anywhere from about usually 30 to 50 either salespeople, manager, or even executives. 
so I have definitely a great passion for teaching and seeing that transformation and change as well and providing those new, uh, the, the skills and the confidence to salespeople who were new at the company, but we also happen to hire a lot of people who were completely new to sales and helping them for the first time get confidence. What to expect from today's webinar? All right, a few things. I'm going to lay the groundwork here. Um, number one, I hope we provide value for anyone who manages a salesperson. So hopefully that is all of us on here. There is an asterisk as well, though, because even if you don't manage another salesperson and the salesperson is yourself, I hope you will still take uh, away some lessons and some value of really how to manage yourself and how to bring the best out of yourself in your own selling. Number two, we're not gonna talk much today about metrics or tough conversations. That is part of sales management. Um, it's just really not what I wanna focus on today. That could be a potentially a future webinar. Today, we're gonna to talk more about how to bring the best out of yourself as a leader in a sales environment, how to get the best out of your people. Ultimately, you know, anyone can really read a report and realize that leads are down or closing is down and point that out. That's, in my experience, that's not truly what the art of sales management and sales leadership is. So we're gonna talk about a few different things. And finally, um, I expect or hope, it's uh, my hope that one or two of these out of the seven hit really close to home. Maybe not all seven. For, for some of you, maybe all seven will resonate. Um, that's okay though. I think if one or two really hit close to home and there's something you can take from today and now be a better leader for your team, then I will um, feel as though it was a valuable time that we spent together. Got to stop though, right? And set, set the tone because I talked about, you know, some of my accomplishments and the great things we achieved. It wasn't always that way. So m part of my story is I came into the sales role at Equinox and I crushed it. I crushed it right off the bat. I was doing 150% of my plan, 180% of my plan, um, multiple, you know, multiple months in a row throughout the year, which is ultimately part of what helped me become a sales manager. And then I become a sales manager and I'm responsible for leading and managing um, about eight to 12 people uh, between about three different separate teams. And it was a very different experience. Our teams, our region didn't hit our sales goal for 11 months straight. It was very tough. Um, it, was, it was definitely, I don't think only, you know, of course, like my leadership or management, there was definitely a, some challenge in the industry and our company was having a down year and the budgets also were very high, the goals because we had succeeded the previous year. However, along this 12 months was also a journey for myself in growing into this role and learning some things along the way that really helped to serve me when we finally started hitting and succeeding and we can multiply that momentum. And once we did, we really never looked back. Um, the 11 months of not hitting plan, as difficult as they were, were followed by about five years of breaking records and succeeding in reaching heights in, in that region that had never been reached before. I want to share seven of the things that I learned either in that 11 months or even in the six or seven years since then, including uh, spending time with lots of business owners and entrepreneurs and sales managers in my current role uh, at KO Advantage Group, helping entrepreneurs in the business to business space. So number one, you're too serious. That is something that I had to go through myself when I became a manager and when I became a leader. I was very caught up in this whole idea that I'm the sales manager, I, I crushed it. That's why I'm here. And, you know, you are now the person that I am to uh, manage because you are probably not doing things right. And, you know, taking feedback seriously and coaching, uh, you know, sessions, they just really felt too tense. I wasn't really letting go of myself. I wasn't meeting people truly on their level. I see that still, right? So, what, what I recommend is a few things. Remembering one, 
it's not life and death. Even if we are missing plan, even if things are not going the way we want them to go, you know, there's obviously the last year has really taught us like there's, there's bigger things going on. It's, it, it's ultimately really not a life and death scenario. Number two, everyone sells better when they're having fun. Everyone will get better results. I, you know, I know I've experienced this as a salesperson when I'm having fun, when my leader is having fun. And I know that when I was having fun as a leader, my team was getting better results. You know, Dan Pink has looked at this in his book, Drive. Um, if you look at motivation, right? Intrinsic motivation wins every time. People always achieve greater things when they're doing things for the fun of it than even when they're being incentivized. Also, people will remember how you make them feel. Now that I have stepped away from the teams that I used to manage and I'm still in contact with, with a lot of these people, you know, it's not so much like, you know, remember that time my leads were down and you made me get enough leads so I could hit my goal. That's not what they remember. They remember, you know, the, the little moments, the good times, the laughs. Um, when I was able to get buy-in with those salespeople, by really just having a good time and meeting them on their level, then I can get the buy-in to coach and manage in terms of the sales skills and the sales results of where we need to go. There's this concept from Stephen R. Covey, I mean, phenomenal book that I'm sure some of you have read, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about this concept of the emotional bank account, which is really great for all of our relationships, especially though, if we manage people. In the end, we are doing two things. Whenever we're interacting with someone, we're either making positive deposits into that emotional bank account or we're making negative withdrawals. So in a management or leadership situation, right? There's a lot of potential negative withdrawals. We have to you know, maybe provide feedback that uh, they're not per performing in, a, in the way that we believe is acceptable. Um, maybe we just have a difference of opinion of the way things are, uh, should be done. There's all these different instances, right? Where we have to now make a negative withdrawal. The question becomes, have we made enough positive deposits from a relationship standpoint, from a trust standpoint, from even a bonding standpoint to where now we're not gonna fall into a negative balance? And a question that I recommend for anyone else uh, or everyone here who manages a salesperson is how will I bond with each of my salespeople? And I don't mean bonding with them like as a group. I mean, truly like take a look and find out, have I actually found a way to bond with each individual person? I look at the, the things that I've found to bond with salespeople and they are everything and everything. There are salespeople that I've bonded with about uh, we, you know, doing puzzles. It could be music. It could be food. It could be sports. Um, one time it was, you know, our shared love of dinosaurs. Um, it, it could be everything and anything. I encourage you to find that one thing that you guys have together. It's like, think about if you were trying to, you know, meet and break through with somebody really important, like a VIP that you really wanted to get in with who was like super high above you, what would your strategy be? Your strategy would be like, all right, I got to find something to bond with them. Like, that's what I need to do. What I recommend is then taking that and actually looking downward. If you do manage people, apply that same mentality downward as you would if you're looking to break through with someone upwards. In the meantime, what else can we do? Well, I'm also a big believer in the whole idea, which is, you know, one of the gifts of the wisdom of Ken Blanchard is catch people doing something right. This is so, so important to more often, again, than we take those negative withdrawals, we can put the positive withdrawals into the emotional bank account by catching people do something right. We need to go out of our way to do this. This, because these, these actions compound over time. We are either doing this or we're not. And a lot of times it is definitely characteristic of a sales manager or leader to swoop in when things are going wrong or when we're not seeing the results we want. Are we swooping in when things are going right? 
And there's a lot of stuff we can find uh, that we can complement and give the positive reinforcement for. So what are some of the things that we can catch our salespeople doing right? I, I would love to see, how, drop in the comments, right? What are some things that you see or that you go above and beyond that you think you could compliment your salespeople on? And, it, and again, sales is a challenging, on a day-to-day -day basis, it is a challenging endeavor. Love it. Yes, Chris. Consistently showing up with a good attitude. That is a huge one. That, that deserves um, reinforcement for sure. Nick, yes. Staying positive. Again, I love it. Same mentality, right? That is kind of the number one. If, if, if you come into work with a positive mentality, then a lot of the rest will take care of itself. That should not be taken for granted. So as we keep thinking, right, I, I would like everyone to write down these questions so you can take it away after the webinar. Here are some things, right? And I love that I didn't even have staying positive in here. Deals closed, of course, keeping the CRM updated, Qua quantity of the follow-up done, quality of the follow-up done. Hopefully we're, we're inspecting these things, right? Inspect what we expect. Developing their own sales skills, being a self-learner posting social media content, right? Being the loudest voice for the, the product and the brand and the service that we're providing. Helping a teammate out. Going above and beyond to help another teammate. That, let me tell you something, is one of the number one things that should be reinforced because sales cultures can become toxic when people do not work together or when the top performer doesn't want to go out of their way to maybe help some of the other teammates. And of course, goals and targets reached. Number two, no sales meetings. This is a problem. I have seen very much inconsistency among teams not having either consistent sales meetings on a regular basis or high quality sales meetings that the salespeople actually receive value from. So consistency, like many things, is so key. We need to, there's certain, if we're going to do these things, we have to do them repetitively. So that is the expectation. And again, it doesn't seem reactive. So much as a salesperson from your manager can seem reactive if it's not consistent. Like, why are we having a sales meeting? Um, like, why, why, why we didn't have a lot, well, we didn't have one last week. Like, why, why, do, why are they wasting my time with this? If it, if it's, if it feels reactive, it will feel either like a micromanagement or a waste of time. So the way we get ahead of that is we proactively create consistency. Salespeople thrive on direction. They should welcome the direction in the sales meeting. Of course, nobody wants to be micromanaged, but that's very different from receiving direction. I have yet to receive a salesperson that doesn't at least appreciate direction of where you recommend they should go. Also, multiple heads are better than one. This is the time to talk about strategy together. This is the time to talk about what we should focus on and get differing thoughts and opinions. Also, in terms of people that we're trying to close and that we're struggling with, the objections that we're experiencing, the challenges that we're facing, you know, you might not have all the answers as the, as the manager or the leader. The salesperson in the, in the actual experience, it's hard to see the picture when you're in the frame many times, might not have the best answer. Someone else with less emotional attachment or more distance to the problem might have the better answer. And of course, when we bring the team together constantly, we're continually reinforcing that unity. Again, that we are a team, we succeed together, we thrive together even if people are performing at different levels. Why don't they happen all the time? It's the same reason that we don't, you know, we can fall out of the habit of exercising um, or meditating or doing anything that is in our best long-term interest, but then feels really hard to find the time for that day. But what's easy to do is also easy not to do. We have to remember that mentality 
and continue to focus on the proactive behaviors, even if we feel like there isn't enough time or something else is more urgent. Here's some quick tips on running effective sales meetings. So I'm a big proponent of keeping sales meetings very simple um, and, and, very, and very streamlined. So on the, on the one side here, I recommend moving from long-term goals to like today's focus. So for example, you know, the, the start of the meeting is, a, you know, how are we doing towards our long-term goals? This could be a monthly goal or a quarterly goal or even a yearly goal if that's what you want to look at, but there probably wouldn't be enough progress between sales meetings to talk about that. But where are we at with our long-term goal? Next, what is our focus this week? What actions, what behaviors are we going to be doing? What is our strategy to get there? Also, you might want to touch upon next week. Number three, where are we at with our high priority prospects? This should be a continual discussion. This should be a team discussion. We should know who each other's leads are and what the problems and challenges we're facing that together and how we're overcoming them and how we could apply that to, to, to different leads, to different prospects. And finally, ending with what is our focus for today? What are we going to do? What actions are we taking today to reach those goals that we talked about at the beginning of this meeting? And that way we're ending off the most, the, the most fresh and recent thing in the mind, in the head of the salesperson is now what we're focusing on today. That is where we'd like to leave off. We want to have an agenda. We want to establish expectations. So is there anything that you need to bring to the sales meeting to make it more productive? You know, let them know that we're going to go over our top five prospects. Don't just spring it on them at the sales meeting. Have them ready to have that information and also be ready to talk about it. We want to keep the sales meeting short. You know, I definitely recommend about 15 minutes is probably a good length. 30 minutes is by, you know, I would say the longest for the sales meeting. You want to keep it light. Going back to point number one, right? We don't want to stay too serious. We want to keep it light, keep it fun, play music, have a joke, have a game, something like that. Make it entertaining. Make it some kind of an entertaining experience. And also always recap. We do not want to just say it and then think that the salespeople are going to run with it and remember it for the rest of the time between this meeting and the next. Which leads me to error number three. One and done communication. So we have Phoebe here. I'm not sure if anybody has seen. There's a sales meme that's been going around where Phoebe is trying to teach Joey French and she's saying, repeat after me. And she makes him repeat it four or five times, but no matter what, he gets it wrong. And this is on YouTube. You can, uh, you, you can go watch it. It's definitely a great clip. Phoebe is saying, you know, j'aime appel Claude and breaking it down for Joey um, one word at a time. One word at a time, he always gets it right. And then she puts it back together for him to say. And he says something crazy like, j'aime appel papi. And he just never, never gets it right. Um, to an extent, we are Phoebe and our salespeople are Joey. Do not be naive. What I mean by that is when I was a sales manager, something I had to learn the hard way is that my salespeople weren't necessarily going to read my emails and read them in detail. So many times I would check in with them, ask what they're working on, reference something in the email, and they would say, what are you talking about? And I would say in response, didn't you read my email? And I would get two things usually. A, um, no, I didn't get a chance to yet. I was just focusing on some other things. I had to get back to some people or I, I skimmed it. So do not be naive in thinking that as a manager or the leader that what you're saying is being, is, is being um, received with as much importance and as much thoughtfulness as you put into it. We have to repeat things that are priority and we have to repeat things that um, are important to us for it to be important to other people. That is how we signal that importance to others. So repetition signals importance. Do not think that if you say something once or even twice that it is enough. Think of the golden rule. 
how would how would I you know I want to be treated if someone gave me some information right we get bit like think about it is once really enough like yes um you know, I might've heard you say that, but like we get busy, we forget, we move on to other things. We need the reminders. That's why we put so many things on our calendars. And sometimes even the calendar reminder isn't enough. Repetition helps everyone and get over it. Like don't, you know, for a while I was so like miffed. I was like, ah, how could they not read my email? Like, like I'm, I'm giving them so much great direction. Like they're, they're struggling. Like they wanted these email templates. I, I gave them email templates. Like why, why would they not? What's more important than my email, right? Well, guess what? From their perspective, whatever else is going on in their life and their day is probably more important. I had to get over that a little bit and realize that, okay, I'm putting this information out there, but it's my job to follow through if it's really, really important to me. All right, so there's a uh, there's a viral a viral clip that went around the internet recently. I'm not sure if anybody saw it. Um, how many threes did Stephen Curry from the Golden State Warriors, um, which is an NBA team here in the states, um, how many did he make? Did anybody happen to see that video? I would love to know in the chat. Let me know. Let me know if you happen to see that. It was pretty amazing. All right, Matt never saw it. All right, I'm not sure if anybody saw it. I highly recommend going to check it out if you want to be inspired. So Stephen Curry made over 100 three-point shots, which was over three minutes of straight shooting. And he made every single one, which is really amazing, amazing to watch in, as a feat in itself, but as a lesson, what does that tell us? That one of the most elite, high caliber athletes in the entire world who has won uh, MVPs, who has won championship awards and who has nothing to prove, still spends hours practicing before the game, every single time. Every great athlete that you will see from boxers to baseball players, to hockey players, to NBA players, golfers, what have you, spend more time practicing than they actually do performing. Same thing for salespeople. In the words of Chet Holmes, who wrote the phenomenal book, The Ultimate Sales Machine, highly recommend it. There is nothing that increasing, increases sales skills like role-playing. And that is sales management error number four that I have seen far too often is either not enough role play or no role play. I get it. We, you know, none of us, I don't wanna say none of us, some people do. Many of us don't love to role play. Some people hate it. Guess what? If you're in sales and you wanna be great, same thing, you gotta get over it. Number one, Education is not application, right? We can know and understand how to do something. Doesn't mean that we have the muscle memory to do it. Number two is everyone gets rusty. The sales leader gets rusty. The, 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 sale, the salesperson, even if they're a veteran, right? All of this stuff slips away over time. Don't think because we role-played once upon a time that it was enough. It's about muscle memory. We have to continually force ourselves to role play. Hopefully we shouldn't be forcing ourselves, but that's what it takes. We want to be proactively scheduling and, and, and carrying out the role play sessions. Same thing as going back to era number one. Don't make it too serious. Like make it fun. Find a way to make it fun. Like one time my sit one salesperson wasn't in the mood for role playing. So like we used like action figures like and he you know we started laughing and it just became like this fun thing so you know there's always a way to make something more fun and to lighten it up but at the same time there is work to be done and we you know we can't afford to miss opportunities so we have to make sure that we are sharp for each and every one of them here are uh, is a quick um 
the quick steps on how to role play. So number one, we want to plan the scenario ahead of time. That's one of the ways that role plays go south is, all right, all right, let's role play. It's like, what are we doing here? And then like, nobody can really think of like what they should say or what their responses should be because they really understand the scenario. So have a scenario in mind that is planned. Number two, we should be demonstrating if we are the sales manager or the sales leader or um, just in general, if we are the veteran, maybe you task or delegate your most senior person to, to host and run the role play session. They should be willing to demonstrate what the proper way looks like, especially if you're working with newer people. Number three, of course, after we role play, we provide feedback, keeping it simple. One, what did you do well? Number two, what would you do differently next time? And finally, the last step, which is unfortunately what I've seen a lot of people miss is after you go through the role play and they give them and we give feedback, you do not move on. You smile and say, great, again. That is where the learning will take place. That is where the progress will be made. Again, education is not application. If I try something once and I got it wrong and then we discuss what the right way would be and then move on, you, you just, you didn't fix it. You have to practice, discuss, practice again. And then when it's done right, then we can move on. Repetition is the mother of learning. So please get comfortable with saying wonderful again. <sighs> Role play is one of those battles that we wanna fight, but I do strongly and wholeheartedly recommend not fighting every single battle. That is one of the biggest things that I had to overcome when I first became a sales manager. I saw so many things that could be improved. If you take that approach and provide too much feedback or try to improve too many things at once, your people will shut down. Dwight here from the office is a great example of someone who goes, out of their way to fight every battle, he shouldn't. We don't wanna be that person as a leader. Even though there probably is always something to improve, that still doesn't change. Live to fight another day. The question is, what is the one thing that will make the most impact for that person? So going back to providing feedback, right? What did you do well? What did you do differently? It might be tough to just focus on like, what, what would you do differently that one thing when there were five things? And maybe you can give a second or a third if the person is receptive, if you have that emotional bank account to give that kind of feedback. But I caution you, may, maybe make notes of it, take it down, log it and fight that battle a different day. Let that person grasp and come around and make the improvement and feel good about it before we pile more on. And even if it's not role play, even if it's just strategy and direction, right? Maybe we need to improve the number of leads we're generating and we need to improve our closing percentage. But guess what? We can't really do both at the same time. That is something else I learned, right? If you're asking a salesperson to increase their leads, increase their closing, start networking more and start posting more on LinkedIn, guess what's gonna happen? A lot of, a lot of nothing. If we focus on just one thing over X amount of time, then we will see progress. And there's a mantra I learned from an incredible leadership expert named Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall Goldsmith wrote one of the best leadership books that I've ever read in my life. It's called, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And something that Marshall Goldsmith preaches is this concept of AWAT. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? A-I-W-A-T-T. -T. Well, for me, and as a leader, as a manager, it changed my life. Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? What does that mean? What that means is it's very easy to see something that's wrong or not right or could be done better and call it out and tell the person to improve it. But if you stop and ask before you do that, are you really willing 
to put in the kind of effort that is required to see that result change or improve, sometimes the answer will be yes, and then you should move forward. But a lot of times the answer was no. You know what? I don't love the email that they're sending, but honestly, like I, I'm not, I'm just not prepared to take either myself or their focus off of our bigger priorities to spend the time and give them the skills to understand why that email could be better versus just telling them that it could be better and why. Um, this can be applied to a lot of different areas. So I definitely recommend uh, writing this down and using this as a mantra. Let me know how it works for you. Number six, not interviewing properly. Sales is different than other roles. How is it different? Well, people buy from people, right? In sales, we want to focus, what I recommend is focusing less on the resume and more on the person. As a sales manager, after some time interviewing, hiring, seeing people succeed, seeing people fail, one, it's putting the time to review the resume beforehand, right? The, the, in the in actual interview shouldn't be the time we're really focusing on it. We should be focusing on the person. When I receive a resume in the interview, I take it, I flip it over, and that's my notepad. I am not really focused on the person. What I'm looking at is of course the answers to their questions, but more, what is their demeanor, their personality? What is the level of empathy? And also, how well do they actively listen? According to LinkedIn, active listening is the number one skill desired by buyers. Buyers who interact with salespeople above all else value active listening. Yet, only 26% of sales managers report active listening as something they specifically look for in the hiring process. That is a huge miss. How do we test or how do we find out how empathetic and how well someone actively listens? We role play. We should be role playing in every sales interview, some kind of condensed scenario to see how the person, of course, like see their selling skills, but it's more about can they take the information in like a needs analysis conversation and then, and then apply that back either when they're trying to close or overcome an objection or follow up. That is what I look for. Also, how well do they receive? And then we, we provide feedback. How, what is their reaction to that feedback? How well do they receive it? How open to it are they? Like, what is their actual reaction to it? Do they get uncomfortable? Do they, does the, do they tighten up? You know, do they start to, um, you know, change and, and suddenly not look so gracious? And then we ask them to do it again. Can they, you know, can they roll with that feedback and, and learn? So for interviewing, Again, more on the person and more on the resume. Are they going to be a good teammate? Is this someone we can trust? Trust is the number one thing that dominates in sales. Is this a trustworthy person? Because we can hire in haste. And if we do, we repent at leisure. Those hiring decisions can happen so quickly. It can, you know, there is that real strong gravitational pull to fill the seat when we really do need to. But I caution you, one of the most expensive things a business can do is, is create turnover. And sales, it can be a high turnover business in and of itself. But if we're not hiring the right people, then we're doing ourselves an incredible disservice. And it's going to make our lives more difficult. It's going to make that person's life difficult because they weren't the right fit. And then it's going to make the entire team and culture more difficult because a new personality is inserted and ultimately removed. And finally, all right, number seven, no virtual sales process. So this is a little bit of more of a more recent phenomenon that I've seen. Um, as I interact with more business owners and entrepreneurs. And, you know, we all have to recognize that the world has changed. 
and it isn't going back. The majority of businesses have adopted a hybrid model of sales or plan to adopt a hybrid model of sales that will stay to some degree in the future, even when things resume. A couple of things with this, if we don't have either a dedicated sales process, if we've hired salespeople first without a process, or if we have a process, but it's stale and it's not updated for success in today's environment, we could be setting up new hires for failure. Our veterans could be struggling because they have not adapted to or been refreshed on the way they should be selling now. And ultimately we're wasting time and energy, which is the worst thing that we can of course possibly do with our important resources um, in terms of our team. If you look at some stats from, from again, LinkedIn the past year, you know, upwards of 50% of businesses uh, anticipate not meeting their sales targets. Up to 50% of sellers feel that sales cycles are, grow, are getting longer and longer. And a significant number of sellers also feel that prospects are getting less responsive. If things are getting harder or things are changing, are we suited? Are we providing our team with the resources, the training and the structure necessary to thrive? This is the sales cycle and buyer's journey that we have at KO Advantage Group. Um, and and for, for our teams, you know, it could be anywhere of anywhere in this in this process that we could be struggling or not getting the results that we really uh, believe that we deserve. Prospecting is is different. Prospecting has changed now. Are our teams equipped to make the breakthrough virtually to that prospect to create that outbound awareness where they can now get the meeting? Do our, do our teams have the questions and the skills to lead a meeting virtually, asking the right questions in a meeting that now needs to be shorter in a virtual world? 20 minutes is the length that a Zoom meeting should be, no more. We're not meeting with people for an hour, an hour and a half on Zoom, at least not in the first meeting. How can we maximize and ask the right questions quickly to build value and qualify in that 20 minutes? How can we follow up and create value? So much value that in today's world where money is tight, there is much uncertainty, resources seem scarce, that it still seems valuable to invest in the goals that are important to me. The proposal, are we sending more proposals than we should be? We should have an 80% certainty that someone will say, yes, this is one of the biggest mistakes I have seen is that we have you know, we are closing, how many proposals are you closing? You know, like one or two out of 10, maybe one out of 20. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like we are wasting a lot of time and energy here if that is the case. And then of course, closing the sale, following up, generating referrals so this process can start gaining its own momentum and we don't have to work so hard on the outbound side breaking through. So I ask everyone a question to think about, a question to um, maybe write down and spend some time with. What would it mean for your team to have full confidence in their current process? What would it mean for their lives outside of work? What would it mean, what kind of leader would you become? Who would you be as a leader if you're team had that kind of confidence in their process, that they could succeed and thrive in 2021 and beyond. Kara recently went through our training and she says, I feel much more confident in the areas that I was struggling with before, specifically cold calling, prospecting, and follow-up. We have subscription-based sales training options this link here though, bit.ly slash KO meeting, we'd love to meet you for a sales strategy session where we can talk about is your team equipped and do they have the confidence to succeed in today's virtual selling world?
let's talk in 20 minutes. Let's take a deep dive and uncover where we can make some quick changes and what kind of value we can provide. Product or service aside, right? Let's meet, let's talk. We believe that in Zig Ziglar's words, we can get everything that we want as the more we help other people get what they want. We will uh, provide the slides for today's presentation. Um, more than happy to share those. So we will send a follow-up email. Again, the meeting link, uh, bit.ly slash KO meeting to meet with someone from our team. Chelsea, uh, who also recently went through our training, says everyone needs to experience the magic of KO Advantage Group. We love Chelsea. Um, Chelsea made incredible um, strides with her business in 2020. She grew bigger than ever before. And finally, I would love to know from everyone, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. We've got about 10 minutes. So if there are questions, feel free to let me know. But what is the one thing you took away from today? Let me know in the chat what resonated the most with you? What do you think you can now use, take action on, and become a better leader for your team today? Awesome, Sean. Yep, role playing will be become a bigger part of our everyday life. Love it. I'm excited to role play with you guys, uh, Christopher. Yep, awesome. Oh, these are these are happening quickly. So Matt, um, yeah, people remember how you make them feel and think about that emotional bank account. How are we are we taking out more than we're putting in? And yeah, prepare for the meetings, Denise. Right, make them intentional, make them proactive. Eric, love it. The consistency of role playing. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Have that sales manager role play consistently. Keep the, keep the muscle memory sharp. 